The origin of the gospel message way back to the Old Testament, friends, is God's call upon us to leave where we are and come and follow Him. This song is just so tailor-made for the message today by Elizabeth Goodine. I want to just throw in some pictures of her singing this with um, Sister Cymbala from Brooklyn Tabernacle directing the choir. This pictures come from Madison Square Gardens. What a fabulous song. I hope you will buy some of this music. God bless it to you. Continuing to map the steps of salvation all the way from Genesis chapter 12, all the way through the Bible. And it's God's call to leave where you are, step out, and come follow him for better things. Now, for many of you, uh, it is a call to leave your religion, to leave your sphere of unbelief, to leave your faithlessness and your Failure to go to church and seek God. For some of you who are already believers, it's God calling you out to better things. But all the way through the Bible, from Genesis 12 on, God keeps calling. Leave where you are. Leave your country. And we continue into the book of Ruth in chapter 1, verse 16, where we have a terrific story that fits this theme. We have the story of Naomi with her husband and two sons who went down to a foreign land, the land of Moab, I believe it was, because uh, there was famine in the land of Israel. And she stayed there for a while. Her two sons met native girls from there and married them. And then uh, her husband died, and eventually her two sons died, if I remember correctly. And uh, the two widow ladies with her, three of them now, all widows, Ruth and uh, Orpha, and Naomi, Naomi being the mother. And she decided it's time to go back to Israel. Now, uh, it's very important that you go on back in this, uh, the call to leave 13 and get the A part, the call to leave 13A. This is the second part. We'll finish the subject here. But in verse 16, Ruth turned to her mother-in-law who was now going back to the land of Israel. Now, Ruth had learned about Israel and the God of Israel. Or for the other wife, widow, uh, when, when Naomi said, go on back to your land, I have no more sons. There's no use of you following me. And Orpha turned back. She kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, and she went on back. But Ruth turned to her, and she said, don't force me to leave you. Don't make me turn back from following you. Wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. And in verse 12, it goes back to where Naomi spoke to her daughters-in-law. She said, turn again, verse 12, turn again, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight, and should also bear sons. There wouldn't be much future for you. And so um, Orpha went back, and Naomi turned to Ruth, and she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back, in verse 15, unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. Now, this is kind of the reverse of the text, because here Ruth is saying, I'm ready. I'm ready to leave my people to leave my homeland, to leave my relatives, and to follow you, Naomi, into better things in the land of Israel. And so in verse 16, Ruth said, I entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. Whither thou goest, I will go. She became, because of her willingness to leave her country and to leave where she was 
and to walk out with God, Ruth became the great grandmother of the mighty King David of Israel. What a great opportunity she had, and she was willing to leave her country and go and serve the true and living God. Now we'll skip ahead to 2 Samuel. This is the sixth point. And we'll skip ahead to 2 Samuel 15, verse 14. When David is being attacked by an insurrection that was led by his own son, Absalom, David told all his men in 15, 2 Samuel 15, 14, David told all his men who were with him in Jerusalem, let's flee immediately or none of us will escape from Absalom. Let's leave right away. There's the theme again. Leave where you are. Let's leave right away or he'll catch up to us and bring disaster on us when he massacres the city. So here's King David saying to his men, let's leave this place. Let's go on. Let's go somewhere else. Let's escape from here. And God is saying the same thing to so many people today. Please leave your land of unbelief. Please leave your land of false security where you're trusting in your religion. You're trusting in your Baptist church. You're trusting in your Pentecostal church. You're trusting in your Catholic church. You're trusting in your Muslim faith. Leave where you are and come on and follow me. Now, that doesn't mean always to leave your faith, but it sometimes means to leave aspects of your faith where you have learned to rest back and rely rather than put your faith in the living God. And so the theme continues, leave where you are. I want to go on, friends, with the seventh point about leaving where you are. This is actually where it's a little different point where God in Psalms chapter 37, verse 8, a very important leave where you are. It says, let go of anger and leave rage behind. Do not be preoccupied. It only leads to evil. Let go of anger. Leave rage behind. And we have seen destruction come to America in the last three or four years because people would not leave their rage behind. There's a, a portion, probably close to 50, 40, 50 percent of America who were s- extremely angry that Donald Trump won the 2016 election. And they have been raging in one way or another ever since. And the Bible says, let your anger go. Leave where you are. That's an important leave. And uh, it is good advice for America. Now I want to go on number eight. The disciples heard this call. We come to the New Testament. The disciples of Jesus Christ, they heard the call. And Jesus said to them, there'd be no Christianity if the disciples had not heard and heeded the call. I think it was the first four disciples. Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That was the call that put together the heart, the basis of the 12 disciples of Jesus Christ, which were the founding members of the Christian faith. Follow me, leave where, leave your nets, leave your fishing boats, leave your tax collecting, leave what you're doing and come follow me. That was the call of God. There's a number of scriptures I'd like to throw in here before I come to our final point. Uh, Let go of the anger and leave rage behind. We gave you that one, Psalm 37, 8. Ezekiel 12, 3. Son of man, pick your bags as if you were going into exile. Pack your bags, rather, as if you were going into exile. Let the people see you leave in the daylight. This was a kind of an object lesson. Jeremiah 51, 45. Leave it, my people. Run for your lives. Run from the burning anger of the Lord. Jeremiah 51, 45. And then Ezekiel 12, 5. Dig a hole through the wall of your house and leave through it. Wow, what a call. Dig a hole through the wall of your house and leave through it. And then Ecclesiastes 5.15. They came from their mother's womb naked. They will leave as naked as they came. Wow. Here's God saying, I'm inviting you to leave. I'm inviting you to follow me. I'm inviting you to better things. But if you don't want to do that, the day is going to come. When you will leave, whether you want to or not, they will leave as naked as they came. And all of the things that you think are so important today about your life, your job, your home, your car, your bank account, your family, some of those things are very important. 
But you have consumed your entire life on those things. Maybe your religion also is thrown in there. And God's saying, leave your comfort zone. Come on, follow me. Because the day's coming when your bank account and all your wealth and all your material things, you won't take with you. You'll leave them behind. And the Bible says you'll leave as naked as you came. Oh my God, what a cost. A whole life and nothing to show for it. You know, they say you can't take it with you. But that's not the truth. There is a way to take it with you. Yes, there is. You can invest in the bank of heaven. You can invest your time, your talents, and your treasures in the bank of heaven. And what you invest in the kingdom of God. Go to church. Support the pastor. Uh, use your time to serve the Lord in the promotion of the gospel. And whatever you invest in the kingdom of God, you'll take it with you and there'll be a reward on the other side. So there is a way to take it with you. But if you don't leave where you are now and start investing in the kingdom of God, my Lord, there's some people who really take this to heart, even though they're not good Christians. I remember years ago, one of the churches that I pastored, a young man uh, who was involved with his father in his father's business, and he did quite well, he called me. Now, they weren't coming to church. They knew about church and had a church background, but none of the family, as far as I recall, was coming to my church or any church, as far as I know. And he called me, and I think, if I remember right, he gave me a check for $1,000, not for me, but for the church. He said, I made money, I want to pay tithes. And he said, I don't believe in cheating God. And so I want to give the Lord one-tenth of my earnings, probably uh, his earnings for the last three or four months. I don't know. He made pretty good money. And he said, take this and invest it for the church. He believed that you're going to leave. By the way, that young man and his wife, eventually, after a little while, they came to the church and became uh, attenders of the church. And I visited in their home and blessed them. But he started with honoring God, leaving where he was, his comfort zone, where he was earning money, working, and that was life, go to work, earn money, come home, uh, invest in some good things, enjoy your family, your life, your wife, your home, and that was his life. But he realized that the day was coming when he would leave here as naked as he came, and he said, I want to invest something in the kingdom of God. So he started paying his tithes. And then eventually he came to church and began attending. He gave you not only of his, his treasure, but he started giving of his time and came and invested time in the kingdom of God. Jesus said, as we pointed out in Matthew 4, 19, the basis of the whole Christian church, he said unto them, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. That's how he called his disciples. Now, people who don't go to church here on earth will have a bad time in heaven where the Bible tells us that we'll live in the church. Maybe God will take it easy on them and send them to the other place where no one goes to church. And I'm referring to this scripture. In Revelation 3.12, I will make everyone who wins the victory a pillar in the temple of my God. They will never leave it again. So you don't like church? Well, you don't want to go to the place where the people live in the church. He said, I'll make you a pillar in the church and you'll never leave it again. That's too much church for some people. So maybe God will have mercy on your desires, send you to the other place where there is no church and you won't have to go to church ever again throughout all the ages of eternity. You might think that over a little bit when you view Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. We should not stop gathering together with other believers as some of you are doing. Forget the internet. He said, we should not stop gathering together with other believers. The CEV version says, some people have gotten out of the habit of meeting for worship, but we must not do that. So just a plug in there for going to church. Also a plug for watching these videos. Leave where you are. 13A and 13B. You should go back and watch my series on Help is on its way. And you should also watch Old Time Religion 13. Great sermons for you to get into your heart. If you're not saved, go to Lethal Lie 13. Once more, I keep saying this to people so they'll know it. Just go to YouTube. Even if you don't have Facebook, you can get us on YouTube. Just get into your internet, your Google, put in 
www.youtube.com. When you get there, put in Pastor Post, one word, P-A-S-T-O-R-P-O-S-T. You'll get my channel. There's a whole lot of videos. There's over 80 of them there. And watch Lethal Lie 13. Watch Help is on its way. The videos where we pray for you and God will heal you. Now, I, I want to close out here with one of the most touching stories of all. And that is about a boy that left home. That's not the part I want to focus on. The father had two sons. He took his inheritance, divided it, and gave to the one son who asked for it half of his inheritance, half of his wealth, and the son took off left home, went out to the far country, began spending his money on foolishness and drinking and carousing and all kinds of stuff. And he spent it all and famine came to that country. And he found himself as a Jewish boy living in the pig pen, feeding the pigs and even trying to eat some of the stuff the pigs ate. Can you believe that? And he came to his senses. That's what God wants you to do today is come to your senses. And he said, my father at home, even the servants in my father's house have more than I have. They don't sit in the pig pen hungry to eat some of what the pigs are eating. He said, I'm going to get out of here and I'm going to leave this place and I'm going back to father and home. And I'm going to say, Father, I'm not worthy to be your son anymore. I've sinned against you and against God, but just make me one of your servants. The servants in my father's house have it better than I'm having here in the far country living in the pig pen. And so the Bible tells that story. I will arise and go to my Father. And God's calling you, my friend, to arise and go to your heavenly Father. And Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. That's the part of the great Father. When the Father in the story saw his son coming a long way down the road, he was able to recognize him. And he ran to meet him and threw his arms around him and hugged him and welcomed him back. And the son said, Father, I'm not worthy to be your son any longer. I have spent your living, your, your inheritance on foolishness. Just make me one of your servants. The father didn't want to hear it. The father didn't want to hear it. He just wiped that all out. He said, son, come on back. Now, he didn't get that inheritance that he wasted. But he sure got reinstated to the family. The father called for a feast and they killed the fatted calf and they had a celebration and the older brother was upset about it. But he welcomed that young brother back into the family again because he got up from the pig pen where he was and he left that place. And I'm telling you, I'm talking to somebody today who's living in a pig pen and God's calling you to get up and leave there. Oh, and the father is waiting with outstretched arms to welcome you into his family and into his uh, comfort, and into his home and into heaven forever. And God's saying, get up and leave where you are. Will you do that? Will you do that? Will you get up and leave where you are? Well, I've taken enough time with this theme. We've traced it kind of through the Bible. We could go further. I had tons of scriptures, but all through from Genesis 12, right on through to the end of the Bible, uh, when, when, uh, the Bible promises that Jesus is coming and he's going to call us to leave this whole world and go up to be with him from there on. Amen. We are forever with the Lord. And this theme goes right straight through from Genesis 12 all the way through the Bible. Leave where you are and come and follow me. I will give you better things. That's what God's calling people to do today. So I want to close with a story, but it's not my story. And I can't even tell it very well. Uh, I'm going to let the man who told it actually tell it. It was Trey Gowdy, the lawyer. I think he was a district attorney, prosecutor. Um, and uh, he tells the story of a policeman that he came to know uh, who had to go to uh, a, a family dispute. Uh, uh, and when the policeman got there, there was the man holding a gun pointed at his wife. And the policeman had to draw his weapon. And uh, that man fired and killed his wife, the policeman fired at him and brought him down, but one of the bullets hit one of the little daughters who was hiding behind the wall, two, two little daughters hiding behind the wall, and one of the bullets went through and hit her and, and injured her very, very seriously. And that big, broad-shouldered policeman wept and cried at the mistake that he made, but he didn't have any choice. 
He had to bring that man down because not only was the, not only did he shoot and kill his wife, he was going to shoot and kill the policeman as well. And the policeman had to fire and bring him down. And this is the story. Trey Gowdy can tell it. I'm going to put his picture up and let you listen to part of the sound, and then maybe come on the very end of it uh, with with his impassionate. Uh, termination of the story, the finish of the story. He can tell it like I couldn't possibly. And so uh, listen to this story as we close out the programs today, a program today. And remember, God's calling you to leave where you are. When I was a prosecutor in South Carolina, I saw it when a sheriff's deputy named Kevin Carper responded to a domestic violence call. But when Kevin Carper arrived on the scene, William Seach had a handgun pointed at his wife, Judy Seach, in the front yard of their home. And William Seach is on the front porch of a mobile home, and his wife is hiding behind a tree trying to protect her life. And Kevin Carper, this sheriff's deputy, who's not a detective, he's not a major, he's not a lieutenant, He's just your average, everyday police officer like you see all across whatever town you're from. So Kevin shows up and you have a man on the front porch pointing a gun at his wife. And in a split second you have to decide, is the gun real? Is it loaded? Is he going to pull the trigger? Is there something behind the wall of this mobile home? And William Seach is alternating between pointing the gun at his wife Judy and pointing the gun at Kevin Carper. And finally he points the gun at his wife and he pulls the trigger. And Kevin Carper returns fire, which he is legally entitled to do. And he strikes William Seach and as he's going up to the front porch to handcuff him, he hears the cries of children. Behind the wall of that mobile home were two little girls, one of whom was struck by one of Kevin Carper's bullets. Judy Seach was killed. The little girl was terribly injured, but she survived. And I met Kevin as we were preparing for trial. I see tears streaming down his face. This is a This is a big, broad-shouldered police officer in full uniform with his firearm at his side, and he has tears streaming down his face. And I said, Kevin, what you did was the only thing you could have done. You may have saved other lives because you fired your weapon. And he said, I know Mr. Gowdy, but I shot that little girl. I know Mr. Gowdy, but I shot that little girl. We got to trial, and the same Kevin Carper that I met in my office is the one that the jury saw. And the jury came back with a guilty verdict for William Siege, and I made a note to myself, you got to go thank Kevin Carper. As an old cynical prosecutor who's lost faith in humanity, you got to go thank this police officer for showing the compassion and the humanity and not being afraid to weep over the consequences of his legal decision. You got to go tell him, Trey. Don't think it. Go tell him. And I'll tell him again when I saw him. And the next time I saw him, he was laying on the roadside. Shot to death by a man he was trying to stop for a traffic violation. And his fellow officers returned fire and they struck this man who had 30 prior arrests and convictions. And then, not 10 feet from Kevin Carper's body, they performed CPR on the man that had just killed their partner. The finality of a law enforcement officer's death hits you the hardest at the end of the funeral. Where a dispatcher comes and says, Deputy Kevin Carper, this is dispatch. Do you copy? 
Deputy Kevin Carper, this is dispatch. Do you copy? And then Deputy Kevin Carper, this is dispatch. You are cleared to go home. 